Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Justine Clark and I'm a co-founder and director of PALA. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country across Australia's many nations and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and we extend that respect to the Indigenous people who are part of the PALA community. And of course tonight that includes our fabulous speakers Sarah Lynn Rees, Francois Lane and Danielle Homick. I'm speaking to you today uh, from the lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong peoples of the Kulin Nation. And um, of course, we're all on many lands across Australia. So we're thrilled to be hosting a conversation on cultural authority and collaboration as part of the Asia Pacific Architecture Forum. I'd like to thank also the University of Melbourne, one of our wonderful parlor partners whose Zoom account makes this session possible. Um, AWS, another one of our fabulous partners um, who really provides the uh, basis of our whole event program, and to all our other partners who really make everything we do possible, we um, really value and appreciate that support. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah very quickly, but I just want to run through a couple of practical matters. So uh, please do keep your microphone off unless um, you're asking a question at the end. Um, we do like it if you keep your camera on if you can. It's really lovely to have that sense of community here and um, nice that we have to do it in a meeting format, not the webinar format to achieve that. Um, but it is uh, six o'clock here in the East Coast and um, once people start watching Netflix, there's a chance that the uh, connection might get a bit shaky. So if things are going a bit shaky, the first thing to do is if everyone turns off their cameras, that usually fixes it. Um, uh, so fingers crossed there. Um, we've got CPD available for the session and I will put the questions, in, the link to the questions into the chat um, once I've stopped talking. Um, and as I said, we're going to take some questions at the end of the session. So if you have got uh, something you'd like to ask, pop that into the chat function and we will um, uh, get to some of those questions, probably not all, but um, we will get to some and those that we don't get to will still inform our future thinking. So now I'd like to introduce my friend and colleague, Sarah Lynn Reese, who is convening the conversation tonight. Uh, Sarah is a Palawa woman descending from the Plung <laughs> Plungamarina and Trawulwe people of Northeast Tasmania. She's a director of Pala. Well, we're thrilled to have her as a director. She practices architecture at Jackson Clements Burroughs, where she's also the lead Indigenous advisor. She's a lecturer at Monash University um, in the architecture program, the program advisor and curator of black architecture for the M Pavilion, um, a member of the Victorian Design Review Panel, chair, a co-chair of the Institute's First Nations Advisory Working Group, and she sits on the Victorian Chapter Council also of the Institute. Um, I don't know when she sleeps, but <laughs> she's a very uh, wonderful uh, and generous member of the architectural community. Sarah's practice, advisory and research interests are all geared towards um, the aim of indigenizing the built environment. So welcome, Sarah, Danielle and Francois. Thank you for joining us and take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Justine, for that lovely introduction and also for saying where I'm from and doing a pretty good job of it. Um, well done. Um, I would also like to acknowledge country. I'm coming to you from the Bunwurrung, Wurundjeri and Butterong peoples uh, of the Eastern Kulin, their country, which they've never ceded sovereignty of and have, as we will talk about today, ultimate cultural authority over what happens on their country. Um, I am going to ask Fran and Danielle to introduce themselves. Uh, so maybe we start with Fran. Would you mind giving us a brief introduction of who you are, where you're from, what you do? Sure. sure. Um, I'm Francois Lane. I'm a director at Vintage Architecture and Design. I'm, I'm an interior designer and artist. Um, my practice, um, I, I enjoy practicing on that verge where art and design meet. So I get to do some really interesting things. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that the country that I work on is the country of the Yudinji people. Um, I am a uh, Merriam um, uh, of Merriam descent and Kalarig descent. Um, 
and of course very proud of that. Danielle? Oh, also, we should mention that you're both wearing and surrounded by your art, Fran, which is so lovely and colourful, and we're all very jealous that's not in our lives. I live in the tropics. Um, <laughs> Got to reflect that. <laughs> I should have worn my, my scarf of yours today. Um, Danielle, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Danielle Hromek, and I'm a Budawang woman of the UN Nation. I'm actually down on UN country at the moment, so that's a real honour to speak to you from my own country. Um, I've been walking my sacred mountain today, so um, my legs are really sore, <laughs> but I feel very spiritually enriched and um, grateful for that experience. Uh, I'm a spatial designer. Uh, I've written a PhD, which... Um, is actually available if you want to download it from the UTS website um, about how uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have always known and loved and dreamt and narrated our spaces, how colonisation impacted space and how, how um, we can reclaim space using cultural practice. And part of what I was doing today was about un re-understanding my own um, relationship to a sacred space, uh, for instance. I, uh, I do a lot of other things other than that um, in terms of uh, research, but also practice. I have, uh, I'm the director of Jinjama, which is an Indigenous corporation, and we really look at how, how do we um, bring Indigenous um, knowledge and ideas and ways of being, but also country and country-centered design into our practice. And also working as a cultural scientist for the cultural science team in DPI, the New South Wales government. That's my favorite job title of all of your job titles, cultural scientist. How badass is that? I love it. Um, thank you both. Um, I will just quickly take us through the intent of this conversation and bring the, the yarn from here. Um, so as you would have all known from the blurb and the reason that you signed up to this, we're talking about cultural authority and practice. So the concept of practice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural authority has existed since time immemorial. Now slowly but surely the built environment is evolving to embed processes that respect this cultural authority. We find ourselves in a transition period where Western and Indigenous worldviews are not yet aligned with respect to the roles we play throughout the architectural process. A worldview of the architect or consultant as expert and stakeholder as someone to be managed and satisfied without compromising design vision does not represent cultural authority in practice from an Indigenous worldview. And more fundamentally, we need to ask some pretty serious questions about who holds cultural authority within community um, we know, for example, and Danielle will talk about this later, that many Indigenous communities are matriarchal societies um, and have clear gendered societal roles. And the structure of this clearly doesn't align with the patriarchal systems that most of us have grown up in. Um, and the impact of these misalignment of worldviews, whether patriarchal or matriarchal, has resulted in a lopsided experience of our existence, our stories and our voices. So the question for us as practitioners really is, how do we walk the talk? What does cultural authority actually mean in practice? And how do we respect the gendered roles that exist within communities with respect to authority? And who really are the experts? Which you will probably all know by now is not us. Um, so I might just open the question to Danielle and Fran and answer however you like, but it's a pretty, um, setting the same question. So from your, both of your perspectives, what is cultural authority? Do I have to nominate <laughs> you like my students? All right, Fran, you go first. <laughs> when I think of cultural authority um, and those who hold it, I, I think of the knowledge keepers of culture um, and, and they can be many within a nation or clan group. Um, they're recognised as holders of that cultural authority within their clan group um, or within their nation. Um, so it's not a self-appointed role. It's one that comes with um, um, respect and members of the, of the clan and nation um, acknowledge that 
they have that knowledge and it's been passed down. Danielle? Yeah, that's, um, I would agree. Uh, that's a very succinct description of how I understand cultural authority. And I think it's also worth recognising that they work hard to get to that position mm. of cultural authority. Um, it's not uh, something that just is um, randomly granted. It's actually about a continual um, learning process that they come to as well. And it's about the community who recognises them as having done that work. So a question to you both again, and this time we'll start with Danielle. As an Indigenous design practitioner, do you hold cultural authority? No, I don't. I, um, I am lucky enough to know people who do, so I get to work very closely with them. Uh, but I don't hold cultural authority myself. Um, I see myself in a very different role. And I know you're going to ask me that question in a little while. But shall I tell you anyway? Go for it. I'm more of a translator um, at the moment. I really hope that at some point uh, that the, the built environment professionals are able to speak that language themselves. But we're not there yet. So at the moment, that's my role. And Fran? So like Danielle, I see myself as a cultural translator. Um, it's, it's a position that, um, like Danielle, you know, I'm blessed to have relationship with, with people who are cultural, um, who do hold cultural authority. Um, and they're relationships that I've worked hard to maintain um, and to keep. Um, and in my role as a cultural translator, there's a lot of trust placed in me uh, to look out for and, and to represent the interests of those with cultural authority. Yeah, absolutely. I guess it leads into the next question of um, how then is cultural authority relevant to how you practice and how you work? Mm. Fran, do you want to pick up on that one? Yeah, sure. So with, with cultural authority, um, when in projects where, I'll, I'll answer this with an example, in projects where we've um, been tasked with cultural engagement, um, part of our, our job is to talk with um, traditional owners and, and they can be directors on um, PDCs um, and to talk with them to find out who are those people that hold that cultural authority. Sometimes they are the directors, sometimes they point us to others. So for example, it may be um, um, the knowledge keeper of um, plants and specimens, bush tucker um, specimens, um, medicinal and um, ceremonial plantings may not be in that room. So they will defer to, to that person and that's up to us to, to make that contact with them. Um, the other thing that can happen also is that you can have those, those uh, people, the knowledge keepers in that room, they will give information but they usually want to check that with the elders of their clan group. So there's this respect that the information they have at times need to go through this process of, of checking and then the elders will go, yeah, you're right with that. Or you might want to add this other tree that's used for this particular purpose of healing. So um, uh, that's something that, that we look out for. So cultural authority in practice, it's like this, this place in engagement that we navigate and that we use, um, and when I say we, I'm talking about my husband, Andrew, who's an architect. We, we undertake engagement together. Um, and usually that's because he's male and female. And at times, the men want to talk to the men about business. And at times, the women want to talk to me about women's business. So we allow for that. Um, 
yeah, so I, I guess it's, um, we're just very open to um, that, um, to where the, where the traditional owners want to take us when we engage. It's not about us trying to steer or direct them. We will draw upon our knowledge as a built environment to bring out their, their knowledge um, and try and give them as much control over that um, as we can. And maybe before we jump to Danielle, Frank, can you talk a little bit how, um, how you account for that, how you plan for that in terms of how you work, how you make sure that what you're agreeing to up front, because we all know that sort of we have to quote for a, a, the jobs that we work on before we really know the extent of it, and especially with engagement, specifically around time, but also who you need mm. to talk to, how many meetings. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you make sure that it's still genuine but uh, you can put food on your table, basically. Um. Yeah, well, this is one of, the, one of the challenges. Andrew and I um, hold our relationships with the traditional owners um, in high regard. We've worked really hard to maintain them. We're not going to take on a project um, where the client may, may want engagement but might not be fully aware of what the cost of that engagement is. We try to educate when we do our submissions for um, engagement as to why it might be that we're not going to throw a whole lot of uh, clan groups or nations in the one room to save time and money because these people could have um, claims in over the same parcel of land and that's just a recipe for disaster with people in the same room. Um, so we will educate, explain why our methodology is so. This is the time it will take. This is the amount of meetings it will take. We allow for the feedback loops to make sure that the information we've taken has been um, processed and recorded in a way that the traditional owners um, um, reflects reflects what what they gave us in the first place. So um, we have our processes there. Um, so we're realistic about how long it will take, and we have turned down jobs because we're not about to tick and flick on um, engaging with traditional owners. And something that Andrew and I um, have have done now for the last um, couple of years is say that um, if you when we're, we're teaming with others, is that if we're going to undertake engagement, as part of um, respecting that relationship we have with the traditional owners, um, we also require to be on the design team. And this is so that that information that is entrusted to us makes its way into the design in a way that is appropriate and reflects what the traditional owners intend. And we might get it wrong sometimes, but it's why you have that feedback loop to try and minimise that. Um, yeah. um, Danielle, do you want to talk a little bit about how cultural authority is relevant in your practice? Yeah. Um, I, I think I spend, uh, I don't know, I, I probably should measure it at some point, but I can't tell you how much of my time is spent um, with real, in terms of main, uh, maintaining relationships and building them and building trust and um, making sure that I'm um, being inclusive, that I'm speaking to the right people, that I'm that those that I'm not just using somebody for their knowledge and then not going back. Um, but I also think there's uh, that that I have a responsibility um, to country to do that. It's so. It's um, about my own relationship that I have to build with the country that's in question. And that's um, complex, but also quite beautiful because it means that I uh, feel related to place, um, in a, not in a traditional custodian way, but in a way that I feel like I have a responsibility to um, really care for that place. And in doing so, I make so much effort to make sure that the people that I'm working with um, 
are also well looked after um, and that they that their voices come through in whatever I in whatever way I can um, and make sure that I'm completely continuously returning back to them and having yarns and um, giving them the voice in the project even if um, even if I'm the one saying the words, if that makes sense. Um, so it's a, a I, yeah, there's an, a lot of time, uh, an awful lot of time that I spend with those relationships. It's a joy though, uh, but you know, getting other work done while you're also doing that, it's, it's a more than full-time job. Um, and as you've heard earlier, I'm juggling more than full-time jobs as it is so <laughs> so it's a it but I do have get to have a very interesting life in terms of who I get to talk to and I um I have I have to say that it I'm you know I wouldn't change it for anything yes sometimes things go wrong that's part of the process and part of the um part of the challenge of of working in this space but I'd rather be in it and do my best to make things go well than to not say anything and know that somebody's voice isn't being heard because I'm related to that person in some way or I have a responsibility to that place in some way. I think there's an extra layer of responsibility when you're an Indigenous person. Um, we're designers, but in this space of cultural translation, um, mob hold us accountable and the, the, the community, the Indigenous community of Australia is, I think, very small. Word gets around. And I don't want to have members of my family um, chipping me because I haven't acted in a, in a respectful uh, way with people. So um, I think that adds to the sense of responsibility. It also helps us, I guess, with that cultural background. We, we know what to look for when we're trying to identify those who hold cultural authority. Um, I don't know about you, Danielle, but we have a lot of eye talk up this way. So things may not be said, but the nonverbal communications are off the charts. And so that's something that, um, uh, that, that I look out for. Yeah. You, you've both mentioned speaking to the right people. Um, <laughs> what to look for when you're trying to understand who has the cultural authority on any given topic. Um, and the fact that not one single person or one person doesn't hold the cultural authority on all matters, um, that actually people have specific roles in terms of the knowledge that they are entrusted to hold. So I wonder if you could talk, and I know, sorry, I know in the context of this that there are multiple ways of working and every project is different, but I wonder if you could each talk to some examples. You don't have to name projects. Um, but some examples of how you've uh, understood who those traditional owners or those with cultural authority are in a project and know when you're talking to the right people versus the not right, not right people. I can start, Danielle, if you like. Um, Andrew and I um, had the pleasure of engaging with um, the community of Yarrabah for a community healing centre um, some years ago. Um, we as part of that, we um, undertook a, or facilitated a design, a design charrette with a number of the stakeholders and user groups that were identified by the client, which was an Aboriginal health organisation. In the design charrette, um, we had our um, bubble, little, little bubbles, like a bubble diagram, identifying spaces so that we could work with the different groups in that design charrette to place um, spaces and their functions um, so that they could um, give us that information of what was necessary to go side by side or, or give space or privacy, whatever. Um, the groups were, di were divided into, and this was something that the participants led into elders into um, traditional owners, into um, men's groups, into women's groups. And what we found um, as we sat with the different groups was that 
there would be spaces that were left blank. And we, we would ask the members, what's going on here? So this would be to the women's group, oh, why have you left that area blank? And they would say, that's for the men to plan that area. And this was the same with the men. There was that respect given to the women's knowledge in that space and to the elders and to the traditional owners. Um, it was really beautiful to watch just the respect that was given to the different groups um, and a recognition that their contributions um, were, were um, to be captured and that others wouldn't speak for them. So I guess that's an example of cultural authority taking place within a mixed group from that community. Mm. Danielle? Um, yeah, there's a project I'm currently working on, um, which I can't name because it's a little bit secret, which is a bit challenging when you have to um, keep a secret according to the client, um, but you also have to do this work where you can't keep a secret in some ways um, because you need to be able to talk to the people who have that cultural authority. And that's one of the challenges of, of our role. Um, so I won't name the project, but it is a current project I'm working on. And uh, I choose mostly to work in Sydney because I'm related to people in Sydney and I can therefore, um, many people in Sydney, and I um, have very good relationships with people there and I can therefore um, ask them who to speak to if I don't know already. And so they usually give me the, the right names of the right people who are the cultural knowledge holders for that particular place um, or whatever it might be. And I, and I usually ask for an, in, if I don't know them, I will ask uh, for them to introduce me so that it's um, coming from a safe place or that person who I don't know. Um, but I do tend to, I'm luckily, luckily I do tend to know enough people that I can go to for advice about who to talk to. Um, but I like, and like I said, I've spent a long time building those relationships and maintaining them. And um, uh, in this particular project, I was introduced to the right person who was then able to introduce me to people. Turns out I was related to uh, at least one of them. That happens a lot with for me, <laughs> for me in Sydney, um, which is very beautiful, and I'm very lucky to have that. Um, uh, but the others, they because that introduction came through people who they trusted, they were happy to speak with me. And um, as I spoke with them, that my way with them is quite um i guess i i don't it's not formal at all it's um i will explain of course what i what what we're here for but then i let them guide the, the conversation as much as possible and give them just some prompts so that it's very much coming from their own perspective and their own way of speaking and that gives them the um ability to um to express what they need to express to me irrespective of what others have said often enough these will be one-on-one -on -one. um it's because the sydney space is complex and uh but sometimes when it when people feel, are happy to speak together then it will be um in small groups i i uh, don't have the capacity to do large-scale consultation and i think it's a different pro I think that is a different role and it's a really important one, but I, and I know people who do it, so I can ask them to do that um, for the project if need be, but I don't think that I, that's my role in this project to do large scale consultation. Can you talk a little bit about that? So what you see is the difference between a large scale consultation or engagement and these one-on-one -on -one conversations and what the difference is in terms of engagement in that sense? Yeah, of course. Um, I, uh, like I said, I think there's a really important role that is played for people who do that. And um, I really respect them because it takes a lot of um, knowledge and energy and time and to get it wrong. 
Um, I, uh, and I, and that is really about understanding how, as a community, um, they feel about something and um, trying to come to some sort of understanding as a community. Uh, these one-on-one -on -one engagements that I do or small group engagements are about what's the specific knowledge that I need to know or what's the specific story that, that I can help to inform this design process. Um, and so it's a really different question that I'm asking and I'm asking them quite personally, whereas a consultation it is about understanding as a, an understanding as a group. Um, yeah, so it's, I, I think they're both really important. I just think that they're different. And I think there's a third type of consultation um, that, or engagement that I, that I think is important, which is the engagement with country. And I have to do that so that I do the best thing for country. And I, I spend a long time out on country, wherever it is, even if it's in the middle of the city, spending time there, um, trying to get the sense of that place, trying to um, fall in love with it. I know that sounds cheesy, <laughs> but it's actually the truth. I spend a long time trying to, fall, trying to understand that country and, and um, falling in love with the place. And um, that relationship that I spend building means that those people, when I go to them and say, I, um, this is what I feel as well, they also relate back to me because they know that I've put in the time and energy to really love their place and love their, um, and to, to understand it in the best way I can as somebody who's not related to that place, but who wants to do my best for it. Um, I would love to jump to a question that's a few few rungs down the list, but um, in response to what you've just said, Danielle, do you think that country has cultural authority? Yep. Yeah. I think country has to have cultural authority. I mean, country gives us all culture, of course, and gives us all knowledge about itself, herself, um, depending on how you speak about country. Um, countries. Um, I believe country can communicate. I believe that all entities in country can communicate. Yes, they don't use that, the language that we use as humans, but we, if you are open to um, understanding the world in a different way, and I think this is the way that our ancestors always understood the world, um, you can sense what country is saying to you. And um, I've had very strong personal responses to things. Just yesterday, I um, came, you know, we've had these terrible storms recently um, down the east coast of New South Wales. And uh, we, I came upon a tree that came down in, and um, I just felt like I needed to go and be with that tree and hear that tree and what that tree needed me to hear as one that was in the final stages of its life. And it was, I know, like I said, I know this sounds cheesy, but it was an incre incredibly impactful experience for me. And I, I really feel like that tree felt heard in that moment because I spent that time um, understanding it. Now, tr a tree is just one part of country, of course. And, and if you imagine that every entity in country has cultural authority and every entity in country has the capacity to communicate then how about if we started listening to country as, as cultural authority as well? Mm. Brian, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I think, I don't know if this is a term that you've used, Danielle, but if you look after country, country will look after you. I know I've, I've read that um, some New South Wales government architect um, policy, but um, that's something that I guess uh, references that for Indigenous people, the spiritual the mental, um, uh, the, yeah, like you have the country, all of these elements connecting together that link to the well-being of, of that person, of that person on country. Um, I know that every time I go back up to the Straits and I go back to Kariri, um, my family island, there's this sense of, knowing this country and knowing that relatives before me have, have lived off this land. And 
if we look after it, you know, it will continue to feed our family. So that's going into the smaller, but it, it also applies when you look at country beyond that um, to the city and, you know, country that has been concreted over, you know, how, how do we respect country when so much has been covered over and almost like disgraced um, in not referencing what it first was and how the, um, the traditional owners of that country, how, how much they love and respect their land. Yeah, it's like um, country's been suffocated by everything that we've done to it and it's our responsibility to let it breathe again in that way and come back to life, resuscitate it. Mm. Um, Danielle, you said just before you referred to country as she. I wondered if you would be happy to talk a little bit about gendered roles and their respective authorities with country and community or gendered landscapes, matricent, mat I can't say the word, matricent, yeah. yeah, you can say it. <laughs> I will. Um, Look, this is, uh, and um, uh, I guess we, you've probably all heard about women's and men's sites. And um, in part, that's what it's about. In part, it's about that women have responsibility for particular sites and men have responsibility for other sites. And they still maintain that and they still have that. That's never gone away. It doesn't matter what you've done to that country. It's still there. Um, but there's also gendered landscapes and this is part of cultural landscapes, you know, those really big swathes of country that, um, or of land that, um, that go across really large areas. And this isn't everywhere, but I do know of landscapes that are female or specific um, parts of the landscape that have male um, that are identified as male. For instance, down here on Yuan Country, we have two, we have many sacred mountains. Let me be really clear, but we have two that we, um, that I'm going to talk about. Bayamanga, um, Bayamanga, I think is the right way to say it. Uh, and Gulaga. Gulaga is the mountain I climbed today. That's why I'm in pain, but that's good pain because I got richer for doing so and not richer in money which are in other ways. Um, Bayamanga is, uh, is what broadly known to be a male mountain or a men's mountain and Gulaga is broadly known to be the mother mountain, a female mountain. Um, that being said, it doesn't mean that men don't go on Gulaga and it doesn't mean that women don't go on Bayamanga. It just means that the, that cultural landscape is, also, is understood as being male, but also um, that uh, there are specific roles that um, males and females play that are quite different than in other places. And so understanding those roles that, that, that are gendered is really important to design because it changes how you act, how you behave about around that place. Understanding that at Gulaga, um, men at certain points can't go any further because that's women's business after that. Doesn't mean that men don't go there and it doesn't mean they just sit around waiting when they get to that point. They have a role even at that point um, to, uh, to, to do cert probably um, certain caretaking, I'd imagine, in care for country. I'm not a male, so what would I know? What would I know? There's also the, um, there's also, um, the other thing to talk about in terms of matricentricity. But matricentric means um, centred around the mother, matri, mother, centred. Matricentricity is um, uh, a in a large way how our um, groups in the eastern part of at least this country are um, organised, centred around the mother. So that's, all, of course, centred around our human mothers. But we also know that um, Mother Earth um, is our is our greatest mother and our greatest teacher, and um, and so we are centered around that mother too, the mother earth, i.e. country. Um, and it doesn't mean again that men don't have roles in this space. It absolutely they absolutely do, and they're so important. It just changes the way that we view the world. 
because we're viewing it through this matricentric um, view. Certainly in my family, it's matricentric um, and a bit matriarchal, if I'm really honest. Uh, we've got great matriarchs in my family and I know a lot of East Coast families do have that as well. I could listen to you both talk all day, um, but I realise that we're coming close to the point where we should be asking questions of the audience. So if anybody wants to ask a question, maybe pop it in the chat box and I will ask one or two more questions of Danielle and Fran before we have a look at what's in there. Um, Fran, I'm interested in asking a question in a conversation that we've had before. At what point does a site, as in an architectural site, become more than a building site? Um, when does it take back its first position of being country? When does it reclaim its cultural authority in that sense? Mm. It's such a big question, hey, and I'm still pondering that. I think I've, it, it's something that I'm still working over myself. Um, for uh, one project uh, where Andrew and I provided engagement for, it was a public project on the waterfront of Cairns. Um, we walked with the traditional owners at different times because they were feeding. Um, but we walked with them to find out what was it about this site that was special to them. And they didn't just look at the site, they looked out from the site. So they looked at uh, uh, special places in the mountains um, that you could see from that site. And, uh, and they talked about um, the marine life that would come in into the inlet. They talked about how before the inlet was dredged, um, people used to walk across the inlet to come to that side of Cairns. Uh, I, that's when I think you start to see a site becoming more than just, you know, a, a site with, with the attributes required um, to fulfil, you know, a need, a function. Um, for society, when you listen to the traditional owners talk about a site, it, it's so much more than that. I know that for the, the architects who were involved in this project when this information was conveyed, and they were there also, they said that they'd never look at the site the same way again after hearing, you know, just what it meant to the, um, to the traditional owners or the claimants. Um, Danielle, do you want to add anything to that conversation about when country takes back its cultural authority? Yeah, I, I actually, um, I asked a similar question in my PhD. One of the joys of my PhD was that I got to um, ask knowledge holders and elders about how they, how they experience country, um, what country is to them, what does country mean once it's turned into built environment? And the best answer that I got all the way through asking those sort of questions, and this was from multiple people, was that country's always there, doesn't go away just because some because buildings are built on top of it. And it really encouraged me to think differently about how I work in the built environment, because if country's always there, then I've got to find it and I've got to see it and I've got to feel it and be be with it. And part of that is exactly what Francois says. It's about um, walking country with people who know it and can say, oh, see that? Or there's a story about that. Or um, what do you feel here? That kind of, um, that kind of question. So um, I, I guess, uh, that w hearing that from those those knowledge holders uh, and, and elders about about country that what they what was actually said was it's always spirit country the spirit of our ancestors always walk there and it doesn't matter that cities built on top of it C countries there so that that just that means that we have to understand country differently right um, because if if you understand that country is um, everywhere and that the built environment is part of country, then everything we do as professionals in the built environment has to take responsibility for country. And then you change just the way you make decisions. You change the sorts of decisions you're making and, the, and your behaviour as well. Absolutely. 
Um, uh, we have one question, which is, uh, I'll just read this one out. Uh, Danielle, can you please uh, locate where your PhD is available online so that people can read it? Of course. I'll, I'll try and find it while we're talking and I'll put a link. Great, thank you. Um, in lieu of any more questions coming up in the box, I'll ask another one that I've got down here, which is um, really about integrity and maintaining those conversations. And Fran, you talked a little bit about this before, about feedback loops. Um, but I wonder if you can talk about how do you ensure that cultural authority or the, the information that's given by those with cultural authority is maintained throughout architectural processes when often we know that we're still working in this system where traditional owners are the stakeholders rather than being sort of in a different position that's more powerful than what a stakeholder is. Um, and how do we make sure that as our role as translators, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people working in this space, how do you make sure that that's maintained and that that's always there? I, I think that feedback loops are just so important um, during that conceptual des design phase, during the development design phase to make sure we capture what is meant. But I think more importantly, before we get to any drawings on paper, those conversations need to be had um, about country, about what's sacred about that country, what can be thought about when you know, doing those conceptual designs that conversation needs to happen to inform prior to the brief being developed so that it can be included in the brief. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, and too many times, and I, I know that this will change, but to have um, traditional owners, um, um, those values, those cultural values um, written into a design brief is the best way to, I think, start a project um, to make sure we capture it. Going beyond that, I think, how beautiful is it? And this has happened, I think, of the uh, Synapse project that um, um, we collaborated with Pod Architects on. At the turning of the sod, there was a smoking ceremony. Um, how about if we bring that way forward to have a smoking ceremony on country when we're looking at um, writing that design brief. So you start it from the very conception. Um, this is different, but a project that I'm working on at the moment, which is around wearable arts, and I'm working with a community arts centre and our elders group. We started off the project by having a blessing on country. Um, members of that group have a historical connection to country, and then we also have traditional owners. But we started off by um, smoking that, by having a smoking ceremony, having a blessing, um, and then a cultural blessing. So there was a blessing from the Christian women in the group, very strong Christian faith there. So we had two kinds of blessings. Um, and just such a beautiful experience happened there. It was just the most sweetest scent that was coming from the fire. Um, and the elders said this project is is very special and we have the support, we have the blessing of our ancestors on this project. We've used the charcoal from that fire to do the concept sketches, sketches for the artworks, um, for the fabric and also for the dress design. So we're embedding um, country into the way that we create. And then the stories um, coming out of the artworks. Once again, we're, we're speaking to sacredness again, um, in what we're producing there. So I, I wonder how can we do this in the built environment? What would it look like? Yeah, that sounds so special. Uh, I can't, I, you need to like tell everyone about that in longer and more detailed processes than we can talk <laughs> about in this environment. Um, we've got a question in the chat from Nicolette. Do you want to ask a question, Nicolette? Sure. So my concern is that if if there is this remaining um, sense of you know connection and, and and understanding of country, even if it's been changed over time, will that um, justify some of the less sensitive members of the development community to say, well, it doesn't matter what we do, we can do anything because the the country remains. 
how do we how do we negotiate that approach? Danielle, do you want to take that one first? I don't think um, uh, I don't think that that's an excuse to not do best by country and best by community. Um, that country I, I agree. By the way, I, I just think that there are people out there. We're just um, I've just been looking at a development at the moment today in Adelaide that's been proposed that's, you know, twice the allowable height, that has, you know, everything else is under the minimum, you know, apartment size, open space, then demolishing heritage buildings. And those people think that they're doing the right thing by the city. How do you, how do you communicate this need to do the right thing by country to people who just don't want to hear? Is, that, is, yeah. is there an approach you've got for that? Um, I think I think people have to be willing to listen to want to learn, mm. um, and I, I think the honest truth is there will be some who won't. Mm. So then, how do our leaders who who can influence um, the way that developers do develop? How can they make better? You know, how, how can the legislation respond to respect country? Mm. Yep. I agree. I think we also um, we also need to look at ourselves as the built environment, as members of the built environment professions and ask, are we doing things in the right way as professionals, all of us? Because it's, it's one thing to look at somebody else and say um, they're doing it wrong, but are we all doing it right as well? Mm -hmm. Like, have, have we, are we building in a way that is making sure that country is respected? Are we taking materials from the other side of the planet and moving them here? Um, or are we reusing materials that are on site? Or, are, you know, are we, how are we respecting country ourselves? Um, yes, I, I agree that there's going to be people who are greedy. And I, I talk about anthropocentricity, another centricity um, which is about how people are are obsessed about um, human and about humans being the most important. And I think that we need to move away from that. I think we're not the most important. And this is why we're in a state where we are having tragedy after tragedy of drought, floods, pandemic, um, fire. We, we, country's telling us that we're not doing the right thing. And if we're not going to listen, well, then it's going to keep giving those messages to us. And so it might not be us who has to convince those people in the end. It might not be you and I who do that. It might be country itself who does that because country's saying this isn't okay, what's happening. Very mm. clearly, very, very clearly. Indeed. Thank you. <laughs> the one thing I'd add to all of that and building upon what you've both said is that it's just because country's there doesn't mean it's happy and healthy. Um, so we have a responsibility to understand what the values are and what the rights are of that country. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is that country has rights. Country is a living entity and we have to respect those rights as if they're equal to us. Um, and if we don't, then everything that Danielle said will happen. And one of the elders here and I often sort of fantasize about things going wrong for some things that aren't going so right on country down here, just so that those people understand that they can't keep doing that. But these stories and these ethics are built into the stories of country. Um, so if you are based in Melbourne or in Victoria, uh, there's a story about the filling up of the bay and Arnie Caroline tells it as the time of chaos story. And I encourage you to look it up online because you can read it, but you can also watch it. Um, there's a great artwork that was done about it, but that whole story, while you're only hearing sort of one aspect of it or the aspect that's allowed to be public, the whole story is about sustainability, about how to work with country rather than against it um, and what happens if you don't. So those stories are there, those warnings are already there and they inform us about, you know, we have to, we have to work with respect to country, otherwise it's, it's not gonna respect us back, basically. Um, uh, Naomi Edson, I think you've got a question, if you wanna ask it. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Um, I guess as someone who's not Indigenous and who has very little contact with Indigenous people in, in my life, I'm often wondering how to um, respect Indigenous culture and country as a designer in my projects that often have very little to do with, I guess, the idea of country and, and all that. 
I, I, maybe this speaks to um, what our architecture schools are teaching um, students um, about country. So I think there's like a gap um, in how to, yeah, I, I think there's a gap in education on, on, on how to respond to country and mm -hmm. where to, how to identify um, gathering content and values, how you go about that. Um, I think conversations like this are great because, you know, you're, you're being exposed to, as design practitioners, how we interact with the Indigenous community to respond to Indigenous values and try and bring that into projects. Um, we, yeah, we, we have, you know, we're working on it. <laughs> I guess what I, I like to often, um, I research a site and find out about the, um, the area, especially it's somewhere I don't know. Um, and often the thing that identifies the site most to me is the, the landscape and the, the vegetation and the animals that probably were once there, even if it's a suburban area that, and they're no longer there. Um, that's the thing that I find the most inspiring about a place. So I sort of try to use that, but I don't really feel at the same time that I have I guess the authority sometimes. I think there's, um, I think there's a, a really important role that the built environment professionals have that we don't most don't do. I, I'm trying to do, but um, maybe we don't do it very well yet. Is about our own connection to country. Uh, everyone who's here on this call needs to find their way of connecting to country, um, and. That's um, not, I can't teach you that. That's you, that's got to come from within you and your desire to do better and to be, to be better connected. All of you at some point became disconnected from country, which is why you're here in this country, effectively living on other people's land. Sorry to be blunt about it, but that's what, it's, that's what it comes down to. And you became disconnected from a country somewhere else and it was within your ancestry that did that. Mine too, because part of my ancestry isn't from here. And that's part of the um, challenge for me as, a, as somebody who has that mixed heritage. Um, so I can speak to it. And I'm, so I'm speaking uh, directly to that in all of you as well, that you have a responsibility as somebody who's chosen to live here or has had ancestors who's chosen to live here, but you maintained that choice by continuing to be here on other people's land to, to now take responsibility for, your, for those actions and to understand what that disconnection was in, within you, within your ancestry that's still there and reconnect to country. Now, I'm not gonna say that's easy, um, it's, but there's some, but it's really important that you do, because when you have a connection to country, um, then you act responsibility, responsibly, you act differently, you maintain, you um, spend time reaching out to make relationships, um, you spend time uh, understanding your role and who you are in that system. And you also spend time understanding how you, in some, as somebody in the built environment profession can, um, act in a different way and must act in a different way. We also have to recognise that, you know, um, uh, we're what, three, are we 3% of the population? Something like that. I'm talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We can't do this on our own because we've been uh, invaded, decimated, um, dispossessed and um, now are in our in, in ourselves going through a a process of reclaiming our, our rightful place as um, custodians of country. But you have to have that responsibility yourself too. You can't just put it all back on us. It's really tiring. And so part of that is making sure that you do know the story, that we're not the ones who always have to tell the dispossession story, that we're not always the ones who have to retell that trauma story. Mm -hmm. um, so 
yeah. <laughs> Sorry to be direct, everyone. Um, it's not for lack of love. I actually have thought about this a lot and I really hope that, I actually really desire and hope that um, people in our profession find their ways to connect to country and find their ways to um, do things differently because uh, it will make my life and my job a whole lot easier and a whole more, lot more beautiful if I can connect with you on country. Mm, indeed. And I think something that, um, you know, may be available is, is work, walking with traditional owners on country where you live, finding out what cultural tours there are and book in. Yeah, excellent. There's heaps everywhere. Um, and the other thing, as ever practical as I am, when we start working on projects, um, when we can't engage with traditional owners, um, and there's two different approaches if we know and have relationships with the traditional owners or if we don't know them, but if we talk about where we don't know them, then we will look up um, whose country we're on, first and foremost, and then find, there's always YouTube videos of elders from all different countries giving welcomes, um, and to their country and actually listen to what they're saying because so often they're telling you in that welcome what the laws of country are, what the values of country are, what how you have to behave when you're welcomed onto that country. So that even though um, that isn't like the same as walking with traditional owners on country, it gives you a sense of you know how you might respond to that in the way that you work. And also noting and just putting this out there that there's a very fine line between appropriate and appropriation. Um, and the line that you walk um, is different in every community. But if you're ever worried about that, ask yourself the question, are you, in, are you using somebody's intellectual property that you shouldn't be using? Are you using someone's cultural knowledge that you shouldn't be using? Yes, learn and listen and understand from them, but you can't use those without permission. So in those circumstances, um, what we tend to do is we focus on the more um, like the tangible aspects of country, the physical aspects of country, looking at natural systems, looking at ecology, looking at materials, looking at how we can create habitats for the flora and fauna that's been displaced and colonised um, from that country as well. So we don't necessarily have to have cultural knowledge or permission to make sure that that country is repaired in some way. It just does it's not an indigenous project um but it means that you're working in alignment with the values of that country even if you can't engage so there are a number of things that you can do um through your own education but i just did want to say in the context of all of that is that you can't use indigenous knowledge without permission so you can be informed by it it can guide your values and it can guide the way you think about something but you can't design with it unless you, it's been granted to you in the context of what you're doing um I've got another question, sorry to jump in, um, uh, from Sophie um, about fear of offending. Sophie, do you mind unmuting yourself and asking your question? Sarah, I think you've more or less um, spoken to what I was um, getting at, actually. It was, it's, 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 um, it's having that ability to engage um, and learn um, but without appropriating, I think, you know, and, and I think that um, because we want, I think there are so many people that want to learn quite a lot and want to understand. Um, uh, at, but, you know, uh, often there is this fear, I think, of overstepping the mark and then make, maybe making, starting to make commentary that's not really yours to make. Um, so I, I think that, I think you've spoken a little bit about how that might happen. Um, so, and maybe there's a little bit more that others can, can talk about as well that, um, that might, might help with that as well. Can I just add one thing before I hand over to Danielle and Fran because I can't help myself. Um, you have to also recognize what your power is in the scenario that you're in. If you're working for an institution, if you're working for an architecture practice, if you're working for a university, all of those have very different powers. Um, and if it's a, a large organization, a developer or a government body, you have the power to create um, memorandums of understanding with traditional owners so that when you're working on projects you can't engage with them on, you understand what you can do. Um, and if you set up that framework up front and it's very clear, that doesn't negate engaging with traditional owners, but it gives you some very limited cultural authority or permission um, in that sense to know how you should behave um, and how you should respond. And so it's up to, to major institutions and organisations who do have the power and the time and the money behind them to do that, to make sure that their 
getting their house in order from an ethical perspective. Um, uh, even when they know they can't engage on every project, but they know that they have a framework to fall back on when they can't engage. And I'll stop talking now. Well, Mo Mona, Mona could have learned something there, couldn't they? <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> Danielle, Fran, do you have anything to add? Yep. Um, look, you probably will offend because um, we haven't, for whatever reason, when non-Indigenous people arrived, they didn't feel that they had to learn about what the protocols of um, First Nations people were. Uh, so I guess be prepared that that's okay. That's part of it. Uh, take the uh, the correction that you receive um, with the most grace that you can, because. Um, if you don't know the protocols, then how are you, how are you supposed to know them? Look, we do put our protocols out there as well. Um, not all of us, but a lot of the, a lot of protocols are well known about how to behave and what's expected and what we need. Um, so, and I, I say we, cause I've got protocols that I put out there, but, um, there are, uh, a lot of indigenous organizations that have their protocols well known, um, or available online and you can find out how to engage with them because they tell you. Um, so I, yeah, but be prepared that that's part of the learning process. When you say something wrong, you apologize, you make amends, um, say or do something wrong, of course, and you make, make amends. Some of those things that might happen wrong in past projects where you didn't realize what was happening, but you might go, oh, I need to make amends now. And that might be, um, later on. That's okay. Uh, at least acknowledge what's happened as well. Um, that being said, uh, we're all, look, um, we're all really busy. Uh, my, all my elders, I can I like, even I can't get hold of them half the time cause they're so busy and they're people who want to talk to me. Um, they want, they want to hear from me because we're, they, we love each other and we're related and care for each other. So understand that and build that into a project. <laughs> Time is such an a, a, such a issue for me in almost every project where um, it's governed not by how, um, how we can work best with mob, but by what the client says. And that's just the wrong way around. Um, understand that that process that we need to undertake needs time and it needs to be done respectfully and with the right people. And sometimes um, I can't speak to the right person for four months, but the project's already marched on. And so um, build that in. Like Sarah said, you have this power in projects to build that in and give us, give us, give us a chance to do that right and to do it well and to do, and to bring that into projects. Um, push back to clients if they're being bullies about time and about money and about paying for things. Um, you've got the power. I don't have that power. I, I honestly don't. Uh, I, by the time I get involved, it's often way down the line. I, I would love to get involved when, the, when like well before a project is even thought of. <laughs> I'd love to reorganize how projects happen to flip them, to be really honest, to, um, to, tr to flip the process. But that's a conversation for another time, hey, Sarah. Um, but you know, give us give us a chance and use what what you have to build to build into the process a different way, which gives us time and money in order to do things right. Sophie, I think you you asked a really good question, and I agree with everything that Sarah and Danielle have have said to you. But the other thing that I'd add um, from my experience um, working in the Cairns region. Um, up to the straits, is that um, sometimes, you know, I've asked questions and they have offended, but people know and recognise sincerity and when they see that you are truly trying to capture what they're, they're communicating and trying to understand and that you want to get things right, um, it does so much good for the relationship. So I think, you know, just not being afraid to wear your heart there and let them see how much you appreciate what's being shared and you value it. Um, I think never promise things that um, you can't guarantee. Um, I, yeah, I, I think that's really important. And I say that in like 
earlier engagements that um, Indigenous Design have been involved in. I mean, we never, we never, but we managed expectations with um, <coughs> participants that whilst we're doing everything we can to make sure that their cultural values are responded to in a meaningful way, we can't guarantee it when we're not on the design team and, and when, you know, it's the client copping up the money for the project. Um, they're, they're challenges, but we just do our best to try and bring everyone along on the journey to value what, you know, uh, the, those cultural values. That's the best we can do at times. Yeah, I agree. And also remember one of our best um, traits as, as Indigenous people is our humour. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't like, and also the fact that we want to share, wanting to share with you, not spear you, is is a real. Sorry, does that make sense? The fact that we still want to share with you, and not not spear spear you, says a lot about our nature, I think. Um, but I I the the best thing about my elders, and I think that the thing that keeps us surviving as a as a people um, or a peoples, is that we. Um, is that we have a fantastic sense of humour. All of everyone I know who's a black fella, it's a, it's a, it's how we get through. So have that, have enough, um, have enough humbleness to to be there with us too. Um, I might ask you one last question just to wrap this up um, and then just on a, a happy note. Um, I wonder if you both could tell me something that you're most proud of so far in your working life, career, being, existence, all of the above? Okay, I'll, I'll say something that I'm most proud of and it happened yesterday. So I was out in this um, Indigenous community. I'm working with these women um, range, ranging in ages from um, mid 60s to uh, late 80s. And the oldest woman there, um, she told me that just on the weekend, she'd gone out and um, bought colouring in pencils and drawing paper because working on the um, wearable arts project, she had realised that she loves to draw and loves to create. And she's in her late 80s. She hadn't done any drawing before. Isn't that crazy? She'd never done drawing before and she started off with these charcoal pieces and I was watching her draw yesterday and um, I ended up giving her some of the archival paper and saying how about you draw on that I said there are people who'll pay good money for that <laughs> and she was just oh. but um, that that has been one of my highlights to date I was just so happy that in her late 80s she had discovered something that she's good at and she'd gone out there and bought her some art supplies to continue doing that. That's so special. That's so gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Danielle? I, um, yeah, I'm, I, I think it's a, it's about bringing voices of hidden people. And I'm, I'm going to talk about my grandmother because um, her voice is so, in some ways the most hidden of, a, of anybody's. Um, she's, uh, she's 90, gorgeous, bubbling and, and wonderful. And the reason I did a PhD in the first place, beyond that I didn't know what else to do with myself um, at the time, was because my grandmother said to me that she feels invisible in space. And I was like, oh, I'm a spatial designer. Surely there's got to be an answer to that. And there was, and it came, comes through in my PhD what that answer is. And um, in part, it's to do with systemic racism and in part, it's to do with what happened to my family, which was that they become part of the hidden generation, which is not very well known, but it's a generation of people who, um, seeing what was happening around them with um, 
with children being removed, with um, reserve and mission managers becoming restrictive, with um, with uh, the diseases becoming rampant and killing their loved ones, that they hid not uh, hid whatever they needed to hide in order to stay safe. And they did it in a lot of ways. And um, that has had all sorts of impacts for that generation of people, including for my grandmother who felt invisible. And the thing I'm most proud of is that now people know her story because I've been able to tell it and I've been able to share what she's shared with me through design um, because I use her method of connecting with country as my method of connecting with country into design. And so she, she um, said to me, she, 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 she feels um, like people are starting to see her at 90 and people are starting to know, to know um, how that, you know, she's a someone because she worked like a donkey. So I can be where I am and I can talk like I do. I don't talk like my grandmother, by the way. Um, she worked like a donkey being a maid and a, a, a cleaner, um, making sure that this is where I got to. So I honor, I want to honor her back as much as I can and what she's ta taught me without knowing she was very often. That's the thing I'm most proud of, that she feels like she's seen. That's amazing. I don't want to wrap the conversation up, but I feel like I have to, especially because I've got to go and teach a room full of students who are currently <laughs> downstairs. So um, thank you both, Fran and Danielle, for uh, having us, for having us, for coming and sharing um, your stories and your advice and your knowledge to everyone who's in this Zoom room with us um, and potentially re watching later online. Thank you for taking the time to um, look this up and listen to these kind of conversations and hopefully you find something in it that can be um, a way for you to develop a relationship with country or to understand what cultural authority is or to improve the ways that you practice or change your perspective on architecture and design or the built environment in some way. Um, one baby change at a time is all we ask. Um, although we'd probably like to turn the world upside down and shake it and then put it all back together again, but we know we can't do that. Um, so I want to thank you, Danielle and Francois. I love you both very much, as you know. Um, and I'll hand back to Justine uh, on a whim for her to close off. Thank you so much. It was such a, um, a generous and kind conversation. And I think we're all feeling very fortunate to have been able to be part of it. So I just think we should do a round of applause, please. Um, name in our name is not here, but we like to do our virtual applause. So thank you all so, thank you so much. Um, thank you to the Asia Pacific Architecture Festival for having us. Thank you, as I said at the start, to all of our sponsors who make these things possible for us. Um, and um, I'm really sorry about the Zoom link problem. Um, we have our recording it and we will make that available. So my apologies after so many online events. It's the first time we've had a Zoom problem. My apologies. Um, but thank you again. And um, uh, I hope that Paula will be able to stage uh, many more conversations of this um, quality and depth and care. So um, thank you. And have a lovely evening, everybody.